So let's see how to answer GCSE biology exam questions on communicable disease, vaccination and the immune system. We're going to look at and analyse a set of data about measles before explaining how vaccination and the specific immune system works. This set of exam questions also contains one of those dreaded six mark questions, so I'll show you how to answer that as well. This first question asks us to analyse these data about the number of confirmed cases of measles between the years 2012 and 2015. We need to suggest a reason why the actual number of cases might be higher than the values shown here in the table. Have you ever been ill? Ever had a day off school and stayed in bed? I know I have. Do you always go to the doctor or do you sometimes trust that your immune system will deal with it and make you better? I know for a fact that not everybody goes to their doctor for every illness, so therefore your doctor can't possibly know you've been ill. And therefore, not every case of measles will have been diagnosed and recorded. Next, we're asked to calculate the percentage decrease in the number of measles cases between 2012 and 2015. This is a common type of question. Calculating a percentage increase or decrease is just a percentage change. In my experience, very few students know how to answer these, but they're actually really straightforward. A percentage change is just another way of showing the difference between one value and another as a percentage of the original value. Let me show you using something you'll understand. If you had £50 but spent £20 buying something nice for yourself, how much has your account gone down by? Yeah, that's right, it's decreased by £20 down to £30. The original value was £50, you spent £20 and now you have £30. What is your percentage decrease? You're asking what percentage of your original money did you just spend? Or what is £20 as a percentage of £50? This should now be fairly easy, but if you're still struggling, use this formula. Percentage change is equal to the difference between the original value and the final value divided by the original value. This will give you a result as a decimal between 0 and 1. If you want the percentage, simply multiply that result by 100. So, we put in the original value of 50 minus the final value of 30 divided by the original value, which is 50. Then we calculate the difference as 20, and this is what you spent, don't forget. 20 divided by 50 is 0.4. You're allowed a calculator, so make sure you use it. 0.4 multiplied by 100 is 40%. So, you spent 40% of your original money when you spent the £20. Your account has decreased by 40%. Use exactly the same procedure for percentage increases. The only difference is the final value will be higher than the original value. So, back to the question then. And we now know the formula for calculating percentage change, which is the difference between the original value and the final value divided by the original value. In this instance, the number of measles cases has decreased from 2030 to just 91 over this time. This is a difference of 1,939. 1,939 divided by 2030 is 0.955, which when multiplied by 100% and rounded gives 96%. This is a huge reduction over 2,000 cases down to less than 100 in just four years. What could have caused that, do you think? The next question suggests the reason for the dramatic decrease in measles cases was that more children were vaccinated against it. We're asked to explain why vaccinating a large proportion of the population reduces the spread of the measles virus. Measles spreads from person to person via droplets emitted in coughs and sneezes. <coughs> If you have a population in which nobody is vaccinated or immunised, then everybody is susceptible to catching it. One person with measles passes it to those near them and they spread it to their friends and so on until quite quickly most people have caught it. However, if you vaccinate people, shown here in blue, this gives them immunity against measles and so they won't catch it and become ill. If they don't catch it, they can't pass it on to others. 
And if they can't pass it on, then even those people who have not been vaccinated have a reduced risk of catching the disease. You can see that you don't even need to vaccinate everybody, just most. So what can we write? We just need to carefully summarise what I've just said. Vaccinating against measles gives people immunity, so those people will not become ill with measles. This means that there is less chance of the non-vaccinated people becoming exposed to the virus. This next question is the six mark question. It starts by asking us to study the graph showing how the concentration of measles antibodies in a person's blood changes over time as they are vaccinated and then later exposed to the measles virus. Before we attempt the question, let's revise antibodies and vaccinations. We have different types of cells in our blood. Red blood cells contain haemoglobin to carry oxygen, and there are two types of white blood cell which make up our immune system. The phagocyte cells help us to fight infections by engulfing and then digesting microorganisms. The lymphocyte cells produce antibodies. These antibodies will latch onto and destroy specific microorganisms. We have lymphocyte cells which produce the antibodies to every infection we've ever encountered. This is because as soon as the infection is over, the lymphocyte cells which produce those specific antibodies remain in the blood as memory cells ready and waiting to pounce and produce these antibodies again if we ever need them. That's why we usually don't catch the same disease twice. We say we're immune. Taking this a bit further then, when we get an infection, our lymphocyte cells work hard to produce the correctly shaped antibodies which will destroy the bacterium or virus. This works well usually, but it does take some time. A few days maybe. In this time, the pathogen has managed to reproduce thousands and thousands of times and has made us ill. Eventually, the antibodies will be produced in large enough quantities to destroy the pathogens and we recover. Then, the lymphocytes hang around in the blood in case we ever get that particular pathogen again. Only this time they'll be ready. They'll be able to produce colossal numbers of antibodies. So quickly, that the pathogen will be destroyed before we're even aware that we've caught it. This is immunity. But what if we can trick the system? What if we inject ourselves with a dead version of a pathogen, one that can't possibly make us ill? This is the vaccine. It's an inactive form of a pathogen. It tricks the lymphocytes into responding as though this is an actual new infection. They produce antibodies to the vaccine in just the same way as they would have done to the live pathogen. Again, this will take a day or two, but this time it doesn't matter. The pathogen is inactive. It can't reproduce and it can't make us ill. But what we now have is a large number of lymphocytes floating around in our blood, ready and waiting for the pathogen to strike again. We can see all of this happening in the graph we're given. The vaccine was given on day one, and by day three, the number of antibodies to it had risen. This is called the primary response. The number of antibodies then drops, but crucially, not back to zero. These are the ones being produced by the memory cells. Then, on day seven, the patient was exposed to the real live measles virus. And look how big the secondary response is. It is enormous. Many more antibodies are produced the second time. The measles virus doesn't stand a chance. It's quickly destroyed before we even know we had it. This is also immunity, but it has a slightly different name. It's called artificial immunity. Right, now on to the actual question. We've got to explain the differences in antibody production after the vaccine and after the exposure to the virus. These six mark questions are not marked in the same way as other questions in the paper. For other questions, you pretty much get a mark for every correct answer or part answer. Here, though, there is a level of response marking grid that the examiners use. You can see that there are four different levels of response, and the examiner has to read your answer and then decide which level it best fits into. You can see here that the top marks are awarded where the answer contains relevant points written in a clear, logical and detailed way. A lack of any logical or step-by-step -step thought processes will lose you marks, as will the inclusion of irrelevant statements. So how can we structure an answer based on this? Think about it in the way you would if you were teaching it to somebody else. Think about the words 
the sentence structure and the logical step-by-step -step processes that I've just used while explaining antibodies to you just now. The mark scheme then gives the examiner a list of relevant points to look out for and I'll give them to you here. You don't have to use all of them, just four or five will do. Then write them down in a way that makes sense to somebody who knows about biology. So to start off then, I'd say what an antibody is and what the difference in antibody production is. We don't need to quote exact values, just write it as though you're a reporter writing an article in a magazine or a website. Antibodies help destroy viruses. They are produced and released by lymphocyte cells. The concentration of antibodies after exposure to the measles virus is nine times greater than that which occurs after the vaccine alone. Then give a reason. These antibodies are produced faster and stay in the blood for longer. Expand on the reason by describing the primary response. With the first exposure to the virus, there are few lymphocytes in circulation, so antibody production is slow. After this first exposure, some lymphocytes remain in the blood as memory cells. And now the secondary response. At the second exposure, these memory cells can begin producing antibodies without delay, leading to a greater number of antibodies in a shorter time. Now you have a correctly written, professional-looking response. And that's the key, really. Make it professional. Use scientific keywords and use them correctly. Now the problem is that most of you don't use these terms and words in everyday speech with your friends. You can help yourself here by reading a few scientific articles or watch a few scientific factual programs on TV. Get used to how they put sentences together and then maybe practice with a close friend. So that's it for now. Keep watching my other videos for some great science content or follow me for updates or revision tips at plutoniumscience.com or you can follow me on Twitter at PU94Science. Keep up the revision and good luck with the exams. Take care.